This morning we want to continue our verse-by-verse series on the Gospel of Luke, which focuses our attention on Jesus Christ, what a Savior. And this morning we want to ask and answer from the Bible the important question, what child is this? What think you of Christ? Whose son is he? So let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. In 1865, William C. Dix penned the following Christmas song, which so many are fond of. What child is this who's laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch are keeping? The answer is, this, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing, haste, haste to bring him laud the babe, the son of Mary. Approximately 1,800 plus years before William Dix penned that Christmas carol, What Child Is This? Our Lord Jesus Christ asked the Pharisees this penetrating question. We've got a little faux pas here, sorry. Matthew 22, I'll just read it for you. Verse 41. What did it say? While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, The son of David. And he said to them, How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Notice the question he asks is, whose son is he? It is this crucial question that we want to answer from the scriptures this morning. For all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, And the aspect of that we will emphasize today is the first. It's doctrine. The doctrine of the true person of Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at a lot of verses. So I'll have some I'll have you turn to. Some I will simply flash on the PowerPoint. So buckle up as we search the scriptures together regarding what child is this. And in doing so, we are seeking to make a a defense, an apologia. Like 1 Peter 3.15 says, we're to be ready always to give an answer, a verbal defense of what we believe. And thus, one truth that has been repeatedly denied and has been attacked over the centuries is the deity of Christ, is Jesus Christ God. And so far in our verse-by-verse study of the book of Luke, we have carefully studied 100 verses of Luke's gospel with our last few studies centered around the birth of Jesus Christ, just as it was predicted. We sought to discern the fiction surrounding the birth of Jesus Christ from the facts surrounding the birth of Jesus Christ and have examined both the favorable responses to his birth as well as the failing responses. And today we want to reconsider Luke chapters 1 and 2 and build upon it as we consider the full revelation of Jesus Christ. What have we learned about Jesus Christ in these first 100 verses of the book of Luke? Now, I say that because there are many who deny in our day the deity of Jesus Christ. For example, in Jesus' day, He claimed to be equal with God and they picked up stones to kill him for blasphemy as the law demanded in Leviticus 24.60. The Jews of Jesus' day rejected his claims to be the Messiah equal with God and they plotted his death. In fact, on one occasion in John 8.41, they ridiculed him by claiming that he was born of fornication. In other words, they denied his supernatural birth and they mocked him for being illegitimate. And thus the issue of his identity and his person 
was an ongoing source of controversy in his day. But it didn't end in his day. For over the years, there have been many skeptics when it came to the person of Christ. Some have said, well, he was a good man, but he wasn't God. Or he was a good teacher, but he wasn't God. Or he was a good example, but he wasn't God. And some even have claimed he was a fraud and an imposter, a madman who had delusions of grandeur. But who is Jesus Christ? And you see, even in our day, there are those cults and religions over the centuries that have denied his deity. You see, the Unification Church says, well, he was a very good man, but he's not God. The Jehovah Witnesses claim that he was a created individual who is a God, but not God equal with the Father. The Mormons believe he was the firstborn spirit child who achieved God's status. The Way International claim he was a man whose existence began when he was born of Mary. The Muslims believe he was a prophet and a messenger of God, but he was not deity. The Unitarian Church claims he was a great moral teacher, but he was not God. The New Age Movement claims he was a mystic medium, a guide into self-actualization. Atheist claims he was a mere man, better than some, lesser than others. But it has been the Christian view, based upon the entirety of the Word of God, that Jesus Christ is God and he is man, he is creator of all things, and he is the savior of the world. In fact, before the Christian faith was four centuries old, a man named Arius engaged in a long controversy with another man by the name of Athanasius over this very issue, is Jesus Christ God? And Arius denied the true deity of Christ. He held that there was a time before creation when Christ did not exist. Athanasius, on the other hand, maintained that there was never a time when Christ did not exist, that he was co-eternal with the Father. And the church council of Nicaea in 325 AD proclaimed that Jesus had neither beginning nor end of days. And the council of Chalcedon in 451 AD claimed that he was very God of very God, one with God, co-eternal with the Father. Sad to say, friends, many today among church pastors do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. But what does the Bible say? We don't go by some church council. What do the scriptures say? And if you believe he is God, could you defend it? Could you support it with chapter and verse? Is indeed he God? In fact, what does it really matter if you believe that Jesus Christ is God? Frankly, your opinion about Socrates or Julius Caesar, even President Obama, doesn't change much of anything. Does it really matter if you believe that Jesus Christ is God if he is? I believe the answer to that question is a resounding yes. It does matter because the gospel of salvation centers in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And apart from faith in who Jesus Christ is and what he has done, you cannot be saved. If you have a Christ that isn't God, you have a Christ who cannot save you as only God can save you. But furthermore, it is absolutely crucial. For if Christ is not God, he bore false witness as he claimed to be God, as we'll see today. And thus Jesus then is a liar, the Bible itself is an unreliable witness, and your Christianity then simply a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And thirdly, let me say that if Jesus Christ is not God, then you're involved in sin and sacrilege whenever you worship Jesus Christ. For only God is to be worshipped. It does matter what you think about Jesus Christ. And that's why we move from the denial of the deity of Christ to the defense of the deity of Christ. As we look at verse after verse after verse that I believe teaches that Jesus Christ is God. In fact, here in our account in Luke chapter 1 and 2 and what we've seen before, has this not been indicated time and time again? We begin in Luke chapter 1 and verse 26 where the angel visits Mary. 
Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled in, at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this one was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Clue number one. Jesus. The word Jesus means Jehovah saves. Who is Jesus Christ? He is Jesus. He's Jehovah who saves. He will be great, verse 32. But compare that with chapter 1, verse 15, where John the Baptist has said, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. But there's no mention of the sight of the Lord in verse 32, just he will be great, intrinsically great, because they won't be in the sight of the Lord, because he is the Lord. Furthermore, we read, verse 32, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, not a son. The Son of the Highest having the same nature as God himself. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, he's the Messiah. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Verse 34, Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to the, her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is born will be called the Son of God, not a Son of God but the Son of God, and he's called the Holy One. Now, all of us have had babies. Those of you who are parents, I've never called my kids the Holy One. In fact, they come out of the womb congenital rebels. The Holy One. A term for a, an angel? Well, no. A term for a mere man? No. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The Holy One of Israel in the Old Testament was known as Jehovah God. And he is called here the Holy One. The Son of God. And then when, Jesus, when Mary went to visit Elizabeth, verse 39, she arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Now catch this. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? My Lord. Now the word Lord is the Greek word kyrios. The word kyrios is a divine title used of Jehovah in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, namely the Septuagint. The mother of my Lord, my Lord, is a reference to Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make my enemy thy footstool. Again, a reference to the deity of Christ. In keeping with chapter 2, verse 10, where the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. But we know from the Old Testament, which I will support in a moment, that there's only one Savior, and it's Jehovah God. And yet here he's the Savior who is Christos, the Messiah, the Kyrios, the Lord, another title for his deity. And that is why in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, when we read last week about the wise men coming, they came with gifts and they worshipped him without any mention of condemnation or censor. And yet, you are to worship only the Lord God. And indeed, that's exactly who Jesus Christ is. Who is he? He's God who became a man through the virgin birth or conception, as recorded in Luke chapters 1 and 2. 
And so we see the defense of his deity is right in these chapters that we've been examining. But remember, when we get to Luke, we have 39 books of the Old Testament written already. Some of them, the prophets. And in the prophets, we see verses that clearly indicate something about who is Jesus Christ. We've seen already Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Notice the virgin birth was predicted. He would bear not a daughter but a son and he'll be called Emmanuel. We know from Matthew chapter 1 this means God with us. Who is Jesus Christ? He's God who became a son by way of his humanity, though he was the eternal son of God by way of his deity. We know in Isaiah chapter 9, in fact, let's turn there in your Bibles, okay? Isaiah 9. Because I'm going to want you to put a couple references by this verse so you can find these other two verses that follow. Now in Isaiah 9, we're looking at some very familiar verses here. They're oftentimes stated during the Christmas season, per se. For unto us a child is born, his humanity. Unto us a son is given. Why isn't a son born in this case? He's not born because he's the eternal son of God. He is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Now catch this. Mighty... God, Al Gabon, not Al Capone, okay? Al Gabon, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. There is no doubt this is a reference to the Messiah. There is no doubt this is a reference to Jesus Christ. And he's called here the mighty God. Now do not downplay that. For how is Al Gabon used? And you write by Isaiah 9, 6, put down Isaiah 10, 20 and 21. Your Bible's there, so you can cross-reference this. And since it's handy, you can see it, or you can see it on the screen here. It says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped the house of Jacob will never again depend on him who defeated them, but will depend on the Lord. Capta L-O-R-D is a term for Jehovah Yahweh. The Holy One of Israel. Notice, he's called the what? Remember the baby was the Holy One? of Israel, the remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God, Al Gapon. Notice mighty God is in reference to Jehovah God. There are two terms that are used in reference to the same deity. So the mighty God of Isaiah 10 is none other than Jehovah God, and he is Jesus Christ in Isaiah 9.6. Now, if that wasn't enough, Jeremiah 32, and you might want to put that right in your reference now. Verses 17 and 18 says, Ah, Lord God, again a reference to Jehovah Yahweh, Behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There's nothing too hard for you. Notice, who made the heavens? Jehovah made the heavens. You show loving kindness to thousands and repay the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God whose name is the Lord. No doubt here. The mighty God's name is Jehovah. And yet Jesus Christ is called in Isaiah 9, 6, the mighty God. There's no getting around it. That Jesus Christ is the mighty God. He is deity, equal with the Father. Substantiated by the Old Testament's use of Gal Gabon, as well as Jehovah Yahweh. And thus, Isaiah prophetically wrote 
that the Messiah would be born of a virgin and be called Emmanuel, which means God with us, and he would also be called the mighty God, deity in human flesh. But that was an off because we know that Micah prophetically wrote that the Messiah would come forth out of the city of David, Bethlehem. He would be born in Bethlehem, yet whose going forth are from of old, from everlasting. From everlasting. He would be born in Bethlehem, but in his deity he has been from everlasting. For who alone has existed from everlasting? Not some created being, but God himself. And so Micah substantiates the deity of Christ. But so does David himself. And I'd like you to turn here to Psalm 110 and verse 1. This verse is quoted in the New Testament more than any other verse. And it's quoted by the Lord Jesus Christ himself to underscore the fact that he is nothing less than deity who became the son of David by way of humanity. In Psalm 110, verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemy my footstool. Remember what Elizabeth said? That the mother of my Lord is visiting me in an allusion to this very verse. Now notice the word Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah, said to my Lord, another term for deity, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now you say, I'm a little confused. How can you have two lords? How can you have two lords? Well, that's the very point the Lord Jesus is going to get at them. How can you have two lords? Who is David's Lord? Someone less than God? No. Some angel who became Michael, who, Michael the archangel who became some man and now is an exalted spirit being? No. No. And you see, in the Old Testament, there are indications of the triune nature of God. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, the great Shema said at every synagogue service, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God the Lord is one. Capta L-O-R-D is the term for Jehovah. Our God is Elohim. Do you see the I am right here? That is a Hebrew way of making a word plural. But it's not translated God's because the Bible says the Lord Jehovah is one. Is one. Sometimes people have falsely said if you believe in Christianity, you believe in polytheism, multiple gods. Oh, no. Oh, no. In the unity of the Godhead, there are three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, yet there's only one God. For you see, in Genesis 1.1, it says in the beginning, God, Elohim, plural, created the heavens and the earth. And that is why when Satan tempts Eve in the garden, Genesis 3, 5 says in the King James Version, For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes will be open and you shall be as God's Elohim. Why does it translate it God's? Now the new King James says just like God, but why does the King James translate Because it's plural. Well, how can it be plural and yet one God? Because of the word one. That particular Hebrew word there is used in Genesis 2.24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Same exact word here. Think of someone who gets married. You've got two people, and they've become one in marriage. Do they, are they still distinct in their identity? Yes, but they're now welded together in their unity as husband and wife. In the same way, God is one. Doesn't mean there's not distinct persons in the unit called God, but not three gods. Just like one marriage. And thus, the same Hebrew word is used here. 
Now that being the case, should it surprise us in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Now some say, well, he was talking to the angels. Really? Were we made in the image of angels? No way. We weren't. According to our likeness, notice the plural pronouns. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. So God, singular, our. Again, an indication of the triune nature of God. For even as we think of creating man in his own image, God created him, and yet what does Colossians 1.16 say? For by him, Jesus Christ, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominion, principalities. All things were created through him, and all things were created for him. If someone says, well, I think all things were created for God, this verse says it was for Jesus Christ. But then again, they're one and the same. So you make perfect sense. And that's why in Matthew 22, 41 through 47, Psalm 110, verse 1, comes into play. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ, the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, Well, he's the son of David. Now, is that true? Is he the son of David? Yes, but incomplete. He said to them, How then does David in the Spirit, under divine inspiration, call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? How can he be his son on the one hand and his Lord on the other? Ah, he's God who became a man through David and his descendants. And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. Absolutely put in their place by the tremendous wisdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, is the Jehovah Yahweh of the Old Testament equal with the Jesus Christ of the New Testament? I'm not going to look at all these passages. I'm going to look at a few and because of time constraints. But I would like you to just compare Zechariah 12, verses 7 through 10, with John 19, 7, 19, 17, and 18, and Revelation 1, 7. Now, Zechariah is going to predict about the coming day of the Lord, in which God will intervene in human history on behalf of Israel by way of defending Israel in the last days. And what does it say? The Lord Jehovah Yahweh will save the tents of Judah first so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not become greater than that of Judah. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Israel. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Question, when did the Lord get pierced? Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a son. They're going to look on me, who's me, in the context, the I, the Lord. Jehovah God, whom they pierced. And that's exactly what the New Testament tells us. In John 19, 7, the Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die. Why? Because he made himself the Son of God. Is he saying he made himself born again? No. A Son of God, he made himself out to be an angel? No. Absolute claim of deity. What was the official indictment against Jesus Christ? It was blasphemy. He claimed to be God. 
who obviously was a man. And so they crucified him, John 19, 18 tells us. So Revelation 1, 7 tells us, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. This is a reference back to Zechariah. And thus the Lord of Zechariah who will be pierced and who Israel will look to for deliverance is none other than the Jesus Christ of the New Testament. Now Isaiah 6 verses 1 through 10 can be compared with John chapter 12 verses 34 through 41. And you can have a little assignment. I'll let you do that one on your own time. But as you do, just notice the plural word our and notice how the application of Isaiah is to Jehovah and the application in John is to Jesus Christ. The third one is Deuteronomy 32, verses 3 and 4. And compare it with 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4. Now, Deuteronomy is written by Moses. It's his swan song. He's about to die. Israel's about to go into the promised land. They have seen the mighty hand of God in the Exodus, in the Lord directing them those 40 years, and now Joshua will bring them into the promised land. And what does Moses tell them? Deuteronomy 32, 3 and 4. For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. Who is the rock? Our Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah, God. His work is perfect for all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. But then when you come to the New Testament, and 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4, notice Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea in the Exodus, and all were baptized or identified into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and they all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Jesus Christ. Well, according to Deuteronomy, that rock was Jehovah God. But then again, the two are one and the same by way of deity. We see another reference to the deity of Jesus Christ here. Now, Isaiah 43, verses 10 and 11 can be compared with Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, and Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Now, Isaiah 43 is the passage that the Jehovah Witnesses get their marching orders from. You see, Isaiah 43, 10 and 11 says, You are my witnesses, says the Lord. Capital L-O-R-D, what does that mean? Jehovah, right? And my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. That I am who? He. Keep that in mind. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. Notice, I am God. None before, none after. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. He is the only Savior. Who's the me in the passage? Jehovah. And yet, what did the angels say that first Christmas morning? For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Clearly a reference to Jesus Christ, which clearly intersects with Isaiah 43, 10, and 11. And that's why when Peter stood before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4, he said to them, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God the Father raised up. Notice, Jesus Christ and God are distinct persons, yet, again, one in deity. Whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. What name is that? In the context, the name of Jesus Christ. Say, wait a second. 
I thought, I thought Isaiah 43 said, I am the Lord Jehovah, and beside me there's no Savior. You're right. The Jehovah of the Old Testament sometimes refers to the Father, sometimes refers to the Son, but clearly is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Another passage one can compare is Isaiah 45, verses 21 and 22 with John chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. And again, the Old Testament prophets are clear in Isaiah 45, 21 and 22. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the capital L-O-R-D? And there is no other God beside me, a just God and a Savior. Sounds just like Luke 2.11. There is none beside me. Well, if he's the only Savior, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there's none other. And yet as we think of the word saved, as we think of Savior, what did the Lord Jesus say in John chapter 3? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him, who's him? The Son of Man should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Sometimes Jehovah Witnesses play a little sleight of hand and they'll say, well, I believe he's the Son of God, but I don't believe he's God's Son. Well, that's what it says. He gave his Son. Why do they say that? Because they try to somehow downplay that his nature is different than the Father's. He gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him and the Son should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son, his Son, into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Who's the Savior? Jehovah God. And that Jehovah of the Old Testament, it's the Jesus Christ of the New Testament. You can see this also in Isaiah 45, 23, when it's compared with Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. Isaiah 45, 23. It says, look to me and be saved. We just read it. All you ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, and the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that to me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall take an oath. To me, who is the me that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess? That me is none other than Jehovah God. And yet we read in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, after we read this section about how he as God became a man obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also hath highly exalted him, the Lord Jesus, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, while the Old Testament makes it clear every knee shall bow and every tongue will take an oath, the New Testament identifies that as every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord Jehovah God to the glory of God the Father. Joel chapter 2, verses 32, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The name of the Lord is in reference to Jehovah God. can be cross-referenced with Romans 10, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 13, for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Who is the Lord? Jesus is the Lord. Notice again, the cross-referencing clarifies for us As we compare Scripture with Scripture, who is Jesus Christ? Now, I sometimes like to refer to this as the Jehovah Witness special. 
And I say that because I've used this at times with Jehovah Witnesses at the door. I treat them very respectfully, but I like to use their own Bible, but you have to be knowledgeable to do this. And I like to take them to Isaiah 44, verse 6. Isaiah 43, 10 and 11 is a good place to start too, but Isaiah 44, 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, I am his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. By the way, how can you have the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts? Sounds like two, doesn't it? I am the first and the last. Keep that in mind. Beside me there is no God. Who is this? I ask them, who is this? And they always say, well, it's Jehovah. I said, you're right. Now you go to Revelation chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord. Quoting here from Isaiah, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And I, John, am writing to the seven churches. And I ask them, who is this? And they will usually say, well, that's Jehovah God. I say, you're right. Later in the same chapter, verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Who's this? And they're going to say it's Jehovah God. That's exactly the term, first and last. Remember? I am the first and I am the last. Isaiah 44, 6. Who is the first and the last? Well, Jehovah. What's the very next verse say? I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and I have the keys of Hades and death. And you ask them, well, when did Jehovah die? And they will say, well, Jehovah didn't die, Jesus died. Say, so exactly. But the I here am he who lives and was dead is in reference to the first and the last. Now, the best answer I've ever got out of anyone is they say, well, verse 17 is this is Jehovah, and verse 18 is Jesus Christ. What's the problem with that? Do you see any change in person there? Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of Hades and death. No change of subject. The problem is they're stuck. And they know it. If they're honest with themselves. Now, the reason I use these verses is they're all trained how to use John 1.1 1, 1 and other verses. You've got to kind of have a few they don't know. And by now, they might even know it. Now, it's not because I want to win a battle. I want to win their souls, their precious souls for whom Christ died. You could also go to Revelation 22, 13, and 6 through 16. Where again, at the end of the book of Revelation, same thought, Jehovah Witness special. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Who's this? They'll say sometimes it is Jehovah. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things. Who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end? It's Jesus Christ. And so we've seen here, in the defense of the deity of Christ, a number of indications that he is God from the birth account of Jesus Christ in Luke 1 and 2. We've seen it now with numerous passages from the Old Testament. But did Jesus Christ himself claim to be God? Now I want you to turn to these passages beginning at John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Now in John chapter 5, verse 17, But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Boy, it sounds like you two are one. Is that how they understood it? Verse 18, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself what? Equal with God. Jesus Christ claimed to be equal with God and the Jews of Jesus' day knew it. My father, literally, 
is his own father. Look at chapter 5, verse 19 again. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in the same manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Notice the son-father connection. What is the significance? A son is a separate person from a father. A son is the heir, not a servant. The son has the same nature as his father. Thus he is equal with God. But also in John chapter 10, we turn there, verses 27 through 33, we see again that in this case, Jesus claims to be one with God. One with God. In verse 27, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Let me pause for a minute. I and my Father are one. Now there are some who claim, well, one in purpose. Oh, no, 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 no. He's not saying that. He's saying that he has the ability to keep you saved just like God has the ability to keep you saved. They're one in omnipotence. Now you say, well, if that's true, why does he say my Father who has given to me is greater than all? You must keep in mind that when Jesus Christ, who is God, became a man, he willingly put himself under the authority of the Father. He willingly submitted himself to the plan of the Father. And thus, in becoming a man, he was not lesser in deity, but simply in functionality. Now, how did the Jews of Jesus' day understand what he said? Look at verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, answered them, Many good works I have shown you for my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Boy, end of discussion. They knew exactly what he was claiming. Not one in purpose. Why would you pick up stones to kill somebody who's cooperating with the purpose of God, but one in essence with God? And so Jesus Christ claimed to be equal with the Father and to be one with God. But in addition to this, Jesus Christ blew the minds of the religious leaders of his day when he claimed to be the I am of Exodus 3.14. If you look at John chapter 8 with me, and verse 24, we read, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am, and that he is in italics, you will die in your sins. I am. Do you remember what was said to Moses when he spoke to the burning bush, which was a Christophany or theophany of God. And he said, who should I say sent me and say, tell him, I am sent you. Is that really what he's referring to? We'll look at John chapter 8, verse 56. Jesus said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now, by the way, the only person who could claim I am is God, because if Jesus was a created being who then created all, he could never say I am, because he would have had a beginning. I am is a term for eternality. No beginning. I am present tense. I've been and I always have been. 
Did they understand what he meant? Verse 59, then they took up stones to throw at him. You know, the twins could use one of these guys. It's a pitcher. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So once again, we see this claim to deity. He not only claimed to be equal with God, one with God, and the I am of Exodus 3.14, but he claimed that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. And we see this as we go back a few pages to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 22. Our Lord Jesus said, For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word of what he just claimed and believes in him who sent me, namely the Father, has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. Now notice here it says that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. I have on some occasions asked Jehovah Witnesses at the door, can I ask you a question? Do you honor the Son like you honor the Father? Do you think, do you honor Jesus Christ in the same way you honor Jehovah God? And they say, oh, oh, no, 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 no. I'll say, oh, that's too bad. So what do you mean? I'll say, well, let's go to John 5, 23. That all should honor the Son just as they honor. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Which means you don't honor God the Father either, then, according to this passage. And that's why in Revelation chapter 5, without turning there, they bow down and they honor and they worship the lamb who was slain, and they give him praises just like they give praises to God the Father in an absolute scene of triumphant worship in heaven. You see, Jesus Christ claimed that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He claimed he was the final judge of all men. You say, well, I thought God was the final judge. You're right. And God the Father has committed all judgment to the Son who also is God. Thirdly, Jesus' claim to know and see him was to know and see the Father, John 14, verses 7 through 9. If you remember correctly, that on the occasion in which Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, the question is asked, verse 7, Jesus said, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Furthermore, Jesus Christ claims that he could answer prayers. Only God can answer prayers, dear friends. And in John 14, 14, he said to his disciples, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Not the Father in this case, but I will do it. And the one that really blew the minds of those in Jesus' day is that he could forgive sins. He could forgive sins. In Mark chapter 2, verse 1 through 7, we have this amazing account in which he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Some of the scribes were sitting there, reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Bingo. 
You don't get it. He's God. That's why he can forgive sins. That's why he could say, son, your sins are forgiven you. Because he is God. He's not speaking blasphemy. He's speaking the truth. And you know, as we think of even these claims to God, to being God, we know that Jesus Christ supported this by his healings, by his miracles that were displays of a supernatural power. His teaching, never a man taught us as he taught. The raising from the dead is only God can do this. And even his sinless life, just what you would expect from God who became a man. You see, Jesus Christ's words, Jesus Christ's works, and Jesus Christ's witness make this abundantly clear for any who are willing to honestly consider the evidence in a fair and unbiased way that he is nothing less than God. But lastly, there are the New Testament witnesses, and I'm just going to refer to these. You can look them up on your own. But Peter gives witness to this. When asked the question, who is Jesus Christ? He clearly says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Being the son of the living God makes him equal with God, having the same nature. And that's why in Peter's epistle, 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, he's writing about the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And according to a little Greek rule of grammar, God and Savior have to both refer to Jesus Christ. It's called the Granville Sharp Rule. Paul Affirm this as well in numerous passages. Titus chapter 2 verse 13 is one of them. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior who is Jesus Christ. Are you waiting for God the Father to return? Oh no. You're waiting for Jesus Christ to return, to appear. And who is Jesus Christ? He is our great God and he is our Savior. He is God that was manifested in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And the word firstborn doesn't mean first in birth, and it doesn't mean first created. There's actually a Greek word for that. It means heir of all things. The firstborn was the one who would become the heir, though it wasn't always the firstborn. Sometimes it was the secondborn who became the heir. He's the heir over all creation. You know why? Because he's the one who created it all as God. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. John, as well, came along and in his writings clearly affirmed the deity of Jesus Christ in numerous passages. 1 John 5.20, John 1.1 1, 1, and 1.14, 1.18. And so did Thomas. In fact, in that climactic verses, verse in the book of John, after his crucifixion, after his resurrection, when Thomas said, unless I see the nail prints in his hands and put a finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into side, I will not believe. And Jesus Christ appears to him. Verse 28, and Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus didn't say, Oh, don't call me that. That's blasphemy. I'm not your Lord and I'm not your God. Oh no, he said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Believe what? My Lord and my God is in reference to Jesus Christ. And you see, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. What is Son of God a reference to? The deity of Jesus Christ and his cross work and resurrection from the dead. And that believing you might have life in his name. Remember in Acts 14, where they were going to worship Paul and Barnabas as gods? They tore their clothes and said, don't do that. We are men of flesh. In Revelation 22a, John was going to bow down and worship the angel. And the angel said, don't do that. I'm not God. But Jesus nowhere says, don't do that here. Why? Because he is God, who became a man, 
in order to die on the cross for us. And that's why Hebrews chapter 1, verses 7 and 8 says, And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But to the Son, he says, Thy throne, O God. God is in reference to who? The Son. This is a quote of Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. And in Psalm 45, who is God in reference to? Jehovah God. To the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Again, clearly indicating the deity of Christ. Now, dear friends, we've covered a lot, and you're probably hungry. You know, again, I tried to take a 40-pound sermon and put it in a 5-pound jar. Okay? But the evidence is overwhelming and clearly on record. What is your verdict? What think you of Christ? Whose son is he? And you really only have three choices. He's either a liar and he knew he was lying when he claimed to be God, or he was a lunatic and deluded to think he was God, or he indeed is the Lord Jehovah God himself who became a man, the second person of the triune Godhead. And that's why the bottom line issue between you and God is what do you think of Jesus Christ? For whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word, which tells us time and time and time again that the Jesus Christ of the Bible is nothing less than God who became a man, who died for our sins and rose again to save. And through simple childlike faith in him, you give us everlasting life. For he did all the work necessary when he died on that cross. We thank you so much. May we worship him as God. May we stand in awe of him. May we yield ourselves to him as believers. May we desire to let our lives count for him. As one day we will give an account to him. And should there be someone here today who's never been saved, may today be the day they put their faith in Jesus Christ and him alone to save them from a hell they deserve to a heaven they don't. Because they realize as God, he's able to save them. And because of his work on the cross, he's willing to save them. If they simply come to you through Christ by faith. We thank you now in Jesus' name, and amen. As Scott mentioned in the announcements, next Sunday, Lord willing, I will be in Michigan traveling there tomorrow, uh, weather permitting, spend some time with my family. My wife is then traveling back here, actually, to be involved in something related to my son, David, and... Uh, Next Sunday, both the morning and evening service at Byron Center Bible Church in Byron Center, Michigan, I will be preaching on the doctrine of eternal security. So keep me in your prayers. Tom Stiegel will be teaching this Wednesday night. Kurt Witzig, I believe, next Sunday morning. I don't know if he knows that yet, but he will. I did send him an email. And uh, Scott's taking the mothers with young children on Tuesday so thankful to have many teachers of the Word of God here. Scott, could you just lead us in maybe one stanza in our closing song? Please take your hymnals to number 383. 383, satisfied all my life long. I've looked for something to satisfy, and I found it in the Lord Jesus Christ. 383. Please stand together. All my life long I have panted for a drink from some cool spring that I hoped would quench the burning of the thirst I felt within. Hallelujah!
I have found him whom my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longings. Through his blood I now am saved. Just a reminder, the choir meets uh, very soon after for a half hour instead of tonight because of the weather. Um, storm should hit soon. Um, pray for your safety. Thank you. You're dismissed. <laughs>